I once had a 14-year-old student ask me, What's a CD? And then it dawned on me. As important as they felt to me at one point, CDs are only a very short piece of music history. Even so, they kicked off an extremely important age of music recording technology. The digital era. Hi everyone and welcome to Music Theories, where I explain and analyze all topics related to music. Be sure to subscribe for more content, especially if you're a music geek like me. This video is part of a short series that I'm making, giving a brief overview on the history of music recording and distribution. Please consider watching the other parts of this series that are posted on my channel. We began with the phonograph and have since traveled through the magnetic era, and here we are in the digital era. Be sure to give them a thumbs up if you enjoy, or maybe even share. The digital age begins in recording studios in the late 1970s. Physical waves, once etched by needles or magnets, are now described and replicated by a sequence of numbers. By 1982, a new IBM PC XT could perform 20 mathematical operations per second. So naturally, as the computers got more powerful, they made their way into the recording process as well building algorithms to process and modify sounds to define their accuracy. Synthesizers made big waves, no pun intended, in the music world in the 1980s. Samplers, delay, and compression were being utilized commonly, giving the decade its signature sounds. This, like most of the technological advancements we've seen thus far, saved time. Digital files are far easier to edit, you can click, cut, drag, drop, etc. without damaging the original file. Compare this to the process of splicing magnetic tape that you had to physically cut and glue without damaging. There was also the benefit of these files not diminishing in quality over time, as magnetic tapes do. In addition, it saved space. Reverberation rooms were replaced with small devices that could manufacture something remarkably similar, without all of the miking involved. Whether or not this sounds better is for another video. The bottom line is, music itself was changing. The technology was changing. The instrumentation was changing. The editing and mastering processes were changing. And so, there needed to be a new distribution format that could cater to the crisp, refined sound of the digital wave. The optical disc was first invented by American engineer David Paul Gregg in 1958. It was purchased by Sony and Philips soon after, and further developed into what they called the laser disc. The idea here is that the digital data is etched and stored on a shiny plastic disc coated in a reflective metallic layer, and that data is read by a laser beam. That's the simplest way that I can explain it. It would be disingenuous of me to try to explain it further, so I'm just going to point you to this video here that further explains how laser discs function. The idea for this technology, still used today, was actually conceptualized and proven in theory as early as 1928 by Swedish physicist Harry Nyquist. But in the 60s, American inventor James Russell had the idea for digital to optical audio recording and playback, which would be stored on a compact disc. He filed his patents as early as 1966, and since these discs were originally made for storage, Many discounted or even scoffed at Russell's desire to store audio on this format. The technology became public in 1970, and Russell had working prototypes by 1973. His invention was viewed by hundreds of companies, including Sony and Philips. After a competitive race between different companies to develop an audio CD through the later half of the 70s, Philips and Sony put their heads together in 1980 and began working on a product to distribute to the public. These rival companies disagreed on pretty much everything about their audio disc format. The one thing they did agree on was that they wanted the playtime to be a minimum of 60 minutes. In the end, the diameter and storage space was decided by the wife of Sony's vice president, who insisted she be able to hear a recording of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in its entirety on a compact disc. And so, the result was a 120mm disc with 74 minutes of storage space. Their prototype was introduced and the CDDA, along with the first disc player, the Sony CDP-101, were ready for market in 1982. However, there's a bit of controversy as to which album was first. ABBA's The Visitor 
was the first to be recorded and mastered specifically for CD. However, it wasn't the first to be sold. A repressing of Billy Joel's 52nd Street was the first album to sell in CD format worldwide in 1982. In the United States, the first album manufactured and sold was Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA in 1984. But that said, even in the 80s, CD players ran about $2,500 adjusted for inflation, so not a ton of people were playing their music in that format. It wasn't until the 90s, when players only cost about $330, that CDs really began to overtake cassettes. Especially since they'd come up with the technology to burn CDs, so that people could create mixes like they did with cassettes. With every advancement in music distribution, the cost to manufacture decreased, while the price tag of newer formats increased. The music industry was booming with the sale of physical music, reaching billions of CD sales by the year 2000. That was until a newer type of audiophile was invented, the MP3. I grew up in the midst of it all, being in my late 20s now. Anyone from my generation will immediately react to one word, Napster. The invention and growth of the internet is indisputably one of the most important parts of human history. The 90s saw a wild shift in communication. Today, we joke about how slow and inconvenient dial-up really was, but the reality was that for the first time ever, people could send things to anywhere in the world somewhat instantaneously. Mail, photos, documents, and eventually, music. First up was the compression of photos, to make them shareable, the JPEG and the GIF files. It wasn't long after that people came up with a way to compress audio files in the format called MP3. MP3, which stands for MPEG Audio Layer 3, is basically an algorithm that drastically changes the size of an audio file, up to 8% its original size to be exact. The intention of MP3 was to compress files with no loss of quality. However, it may or may not go without saying, that information can get lost when you compress a file. This information typically includes sounds that the algorithm determines the ear can't hear or doesn't notice. So the changes are quite minimal, but that doesn't mean that the audio quality is not decreased. I personally think there is a noticeable quality difference between a WAV file and that same file compressed as an MP3. That said, I certainly didn't notice the difference when I was ripping songs at 14 years old. And if we learned anything from the era of cassette tapes, we learned that the average consumer cares less about audio quality and more about affordability and convenience. And what is more affordable than pirated music? Thus begins what some consider to be the beginning of the end for the record industry as a whole. Prior to the MP3, if you wanted to hear a song from the radio on repeat, you'd have to buy an entire album on a CD for one song. That's about $22 to hear one song. Enter Napster, a software developed in 1999 by a Northeastern University student named Sean Fanning, with the help of an entrepreneur named Sean Parker. Sean Fanning envisioned the software to be a peer-to-peer file-sharing service that specialized in audio files, eventually leading to millions of users sharing ripped MP3 files with each other. Fanning mentioned this vision in a chat room at only 17 years old, under the username Napster, a nickname that originated from the tight curls he once had on his head. Sean Parker, who was only a year older and a budding entrepreneur, was present in the chat room and thought that this was a great idea. They met up and developed the product together. Fanning worked on the software, which was ready by spring of 1999, and Parker worked on the marketing gaining $50,000 from investors. They moved to California soon after, hired employees from that same chat room, and Napster was launched in May of 1999. By October of 1999, it had 4 million songs in circulation. By March of 2000, the user total had exceeded 20 million. Basically, users would upload their CD collections to their hard drives, and other Napster users could reach in copy the files, and store them to their own hard drives. As you can imagine, this caused a stir in the record industry, so much so that they saw their first dip in sales in the year 2000, and they knew they had to do something about it. So they took them to court. 
But the thing is, a lot of people weren't really sure whether or not the file sharing software was in the wrong. On the one hand, not a single MP3 file was stored on Napster's servers. It was merely a vehicle for people to exchange. Some artists even supported the idea of file sharing. Wyclef was happy his music was being heard, period, even if the files were ripped. Billy Corrigan of Smashing Pumpkins believed it was inevitable, and Chuck D called it the new radio. On the other hand, many artists, backed by their industry executives, were fighting the idea of stolen files. Metallica famously sued Napster in 2000 and was eventually backed by rapper and producer Dr. Dre. Peter Gabriel attempted to start a legal file-sharing software of his own, Web Audio Net. This was backed by Warner Music and EMI. It was a subscription-based service where you pay $9.95 per month for 100 downloads from a library of 75,000 songs. Yeah, this is the first time hearing of it too. Sony and Universal tried it too, with something called press play. These were obviously precursors to what we have now. But one very important element was missing that was present in Napster at the time. Unlimited. Even so, Napster itself was short-lived. Parker was ousted when he was caught calling file sharers pirates in an email. Not long after being featured on the cover of Time magazine in 2000, Fanning left the company too. Napster was shut down by the Ninth Circuit of Court Appeals on grounds of copyright infringement under the DMCA as the result of a suit filed by A&M Records and several other major labels in 2000. They initially required that Napster keep a handle on files being shared illegally, which it could not. It was liquidated in 2001, and that was the end of that. But it wasn't the end of file sharing. Napster had changed music forever. There were other peer-to-peer file-sharing softwares that seceded Napster. We now have thousands of people with music collections that would essentially be impossible to store if they had that same collection in physical form. So where do we put all of the files, and how do we make them portable? The world's first MP3 player was developed in South Korea by Sehan Information Systems in 1997. The world's first portable MP3 player was developed that same year the MP3 to go. It retailed at just under $1,000 and was a commercial bust. The first American handheld MP3 player was released in 1998. It was called the Iger Labs F10 and held only 32 MB of storage. You could, however, pay to upgrade to 64 MB of storage by mailing your player into Iger Labs with a check of $69 plus $775 for shipping. The first player to pique interest from other companies was the Rio PMP300 from Diamond Multimedia. It sold unexpectedly well around Christmas time in 1998. That same year, the RIAA actually attempted to sue these companies for creating devices that encouraged music piracy. But they lost the case and the devices were officially deemed legal. At this point, around the year 2000, There were more or less two different ways to play mp3 files, an obvious one being CD players, which could read discs with different types of digital audio, including an mp3, and then pocket devices, which had either internal memory or external memory, such as a memory card. The biggest issue with both of these options was the limitation of storage. You'd have to load your music to a collection of CDs or memory cards, kind of defeating the purpose of having a digital collection instead of a physical one. One company found the options to be either big and clunky or small and useless and sought to find a way to maximize storage on a pocket-sized device. This company was Apple, and the device was called an iPod. The first-generation iPod, named as a reference to 2001 Space Odyssey, Open the pod bay doors, Hal. was marketed as the Walkman of the 21st century. A Mac-compatible product with a 5 GB hard drive that put 1,000 songs in your pocket. I'm considering doing a more in-depth video on the development and evolution of the iPod, so if that's something you'd like to see, let me know in the comments. The iPod was coupled with Apple's new software called iTunes, which became a giant in the music industry. For those who don't know, iTunes is a program where you can purchase MP3s rather than ripping them, as well as upload your CD files to curate a collection right there on your iTunes account 
to be transferred to your portable device. Over the years, Apple kept updating and reimagining the iPod as well as iTunes. In 2017, they officially took the iPod Shuffle and the iPod Nano out of stores. They do still sell the iPod Touch, but these devices have obviously been usurped by phones that double as music storage, not to mention unlimited music streaming, which is absolutely a topic for another video. It's pretty wild to think about how much music has changed since the year 2000. It really doesn't feel so long ago, but then again, it has been 20 years, so I think that's just my mind playing tricks on me. I remember MP3s and iPods playing such a large part of my adolescence. And here we are in 2021 where a lot of kids have never seen or heard of one. That said, it's absolutely undeniable that this era of music was transformative in more ways than one. Do we think that iPods will ever come back in a sort of retro, trendy type of way? If they ever do, no one is getting their hands on my 160 gig iPod classic. Stay tuned for the next part of this saga, and check out the previous parts in this series if you haven't already. Also, please let me know in the comments about your experiences with CDs, Napster, LimeWire, MP3 players, iPods, etc. I want to hear all about it. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button and help me out by subscribing if you haven't already. I'd love for you to join and help grow our small music community. Thank you so much for watching.